method uh, in cognitive science and at this emergence, the first uh, uh, growth area uh, was somewhere in between psychology, computer science, and linguistics. But uh, closer to the uh, end of the 20th century, uh, cognitive science turned back from a computer metaphor to the real human with its real body. Uh, with its social interactions and uh, cultural influences upon human behavior. There were a number of so-called booms or waves uh, in cognitive studies, such as uh, embodiment boom, uh, with a special interest uh, towards uh, influences of physical body and physical interaction of the cognitive subject with the environment, uh, which covered uh, uh, wide range of research areas from visual perception to the theory of metaphor as far uh, as, as you definitely know um, of course you know george lakoff's theory of metaphor which is uh, a very good example of this embodiment boom in cognitive science uh, then uh, there was an emotional boom with an interest uh, to emotional influences of on memory, thinking, attention, and so forth, and emotional information processing. Then there was a social boom uh, demonstrating the turn of cognitive science to social cognition, so-called distributed or shared cognition, like joint attention or shared memory, and of course, to what's going on in the other person's mind, so-called the theory of mind and finally what i'm going to talk today there was a cultural boom uh, a special attention to how culture shapes our cognition and not only cognition but also our brain but uh what else happened at the same time uh, was the introduction of new players in the famous cognitive hexagon which uh, has become the cognitive polygon since then. Uh, a lot of social stances and humanities came in, such as social psychology, or economics, law, poetics, and so forth. But this all happened together with the invasion of neuroscience, which started defining research topics in all other areas. Why so? Because the 21st century was announced the center of the brain. And what we have already observed uh, is the explosive development of the brain research methods, methods such as functional magnetic resonance imaging, magnetic encephalography, or transcranial magnetic uh, stimulation, and a number of other methods allowing for studying both structure and functions of the human brain. And uh, this led to the emergence of a number of sometimes funny uh, center uh, research areas, such as, for example, neuroeconomics, studying brain mechanisms of customer choice and trying to understand the brain mechanisms of so-called free will, as neuroeconomists calls it, or neuroaesthetics and neuropoetics studying brain correlates of art perception and production, or neural law, or social neuroscience uh, understanding a brain correlates of uh, social influences, for example, conformity. And finally, cultural neuroscience, which is now becoming probably one of the important focuses of research in all cognitive uh, studies. It's one of the trends of 2010s. And that's exactly what I'm going to discuss in detail today, but uh, what I'm going to start with is that the very name of this 
research area is a little bit paradoxical. And uh, I do not know for sure who coined the term cultural biology, which appeared a little bit before the term cultural neuroscience uh, has become widespread, but uh, this word combination, cultural biology, is really paradoxical because biology is about nature. And nature is something which is usually opposed to culture. But uh, if we try to study how culture shapes our nature, our brain as a biological object, it's not nature anymore. It's not a biological object anymore. It's an artifact uh, or a biological <laughs> artifact as uh, Lombros Malifuris uh, named it. And uh, I'll return to this term a little bit later. Uh, but uh, the main idea uh, of my talk today will be uh, that uh, our brain is shaped by our human culture, probably even more by, than by just biological evolution and biological development. And the first person to propose this idea was uh, a Russian psychologist, uh, Lev Vygotsky, who worked at the beginning of the 20th century and uh, died quite early. Um, just uh, 37 years old. Um, it was because of tuberculosis, but uh, some people say that he was lucky to escape from uh, Stalin's repressions this way. But uh, he was really productive. And uh, what he managed to do was to propose his own approach or his own framework uh, known as cultural historical psychology um, or in Western handbooks, you can sometimes uh, see the term social cultural psychology or just cultural psychology, but uh, his own title was cultural historical psychology because uh, what he was going to study was uh, the evolutionary development, so to say the history of human cognition and its cultural development, both through evolution and uh, within the individual development. Uh -huh. So may I uh, give a word to Vygotsky himself to explain his theory. Ah, a nice question in the chat. Is cognition measurable? I'll return to this question a little bit later. Uh, what Vygotsky says is, in human behavior, we can observe a number of artificial means aimed at mastering one's own psychological processes. Uh, may I add that he compares these means to material tools people use to control nature. This means can be conditionally called psychological tools or instruments. They are artificial and intrinsically social rather than natural and individual. They are aimed at controlling human behavior, no matter someone else's or one's own, just as technologies are aimed to control nature. Uh, for example, uh, we can control our own memory using uh, small knots like in Kipu, or we can control counting using woodcuts to count or to compare the amounts, for example, of sheep or shells or whatever. And uh, if we accept this idea, idea, we should admit that in the development of the human mind, both uh, in the evolutionary perspective and in the individual development, there are two lines. We can speak of elementary uh, or natural psychological functions. We are all born 
with memory, we can remember something or forget something. We are all born with attention. We can turn our hand to some bright lights or a loud sound or whatever. Oh, we all can perceive the world, but we cannot control these processes. To be able to control them, to use them uh, as we want to use them, we need a mental or psychological tools. And mental functions reconstructed with the system of tools or instruments are called higher mental functions. Uh, may I give you uh, an example used by Vygotsky himself, who analyzes uh, a piece uh, from memories uh, by one of uh, Russian travelers at the Far East, uh, Vladimir Arsenyev. Uh, Arsenyev describes how he arrives um, to the village of uh, Udege nomads and when leading them to go back to the capital city, he receives a request uh, from nomads to tell to the authorities in the city about Chinese uh, who were hurting the local people. Of course, he promised to do so, but the oldest person in the village gave him a lynx claw. Why so? Uh, this oldest person explained that he would look at this lynx claw when he comes to the city and he would recall about the request and tell the authorities about poor or the Udege people. What happens here? Uh, the normal natural memory act is the moment of remembering or encoding the point A and the moment of recalling or decoding information. So there is a moment when we remember something and when we recall something. But they do not connect um, somehow to each other. We can pretty well re remember, but forget to recall. And uh, what, here, what happens here is introducing the tool, the Slink claw, which is present in the situation A and in the situation B. So we just crack or reconstruct the memory function so that we can use it in a voluntary way. We can remember and recall what we want to recall. Uh, and this happens according to Vygotsky, both uh, in the evolution, when such tools emerge together with material tools, and in the individual development, when we introduce cultural tools to the child, share them with the child so that the child could acquire them and make them inner individual tools of the mind. So the vector of development is from shared function, like in the situation described by the traveler Arsenyev, when there is an oldest person in the village giving a claw to the traveler, to the intra-individual tool. Um, we use in our head like, you know, numbers for counting of mnemonics uh, to remember a phone number uh, or something else. I'll show you in a minute how it works, but a very simple example uh, I use in my research on visual attention. We all know letters, I'm absolutely sure, and we know them really, really well. We can recognize them in a fraction of a second. Uh, now, uh, Please concentrate your attention on the cross. And I, show you, I will show you some letters. And please try to remember as many of them as you can and type your answer in the chat. Ready? Steady? Go. So, any answers? Great. Aha. Uh -huh. 
mostly one, two, three, four. Sometimes there are longer, eight. What? Okay. I'll show it. Aha, uh -huh, six. That's really good. Let me show it to you once again. Ready, steady, go. How many did you get now? All 10 of them, of course. These were just the same 10 letters. But what we see here is just using uh, a sort of a cultural tool to group or organize these letters in a larger unit. So uh, yeah, good job, thank you. Uh, and what is the next step? Vygotsky introduces a principle of signification, which becomes probably one of the central principles of the contemporary cognitive ne cultural neuroscience. Uh, may I give him a word again? A man introduces artificial stimuli, signifies behavior, and by means of the science creates new connections in the brain from outside. Admitting this, we presume a new regulatory principle of our behavior, a new understanding of determination of human reactions, namely a principle of signification. And now the most important part. A man creates externally new connections in the brain, controls his behavior, and thus controls his body. So the central idea we see here is that we have a set of cultural tools we have to acquire through socialization, through acculturation principle. And by this, we reconstruct and control our own brain. And these ideas come to the cognitive uh, studies, uh, in fact, not really early and mostly through the efforts of, uh, so to say, uh, Vygotsky's scientific grandson, uh, the professor of the University of California, San Diego, Mike Cole, who did his postdoc with Alexander Luria, one of uh, immediate uh, Vygotsky's disciples. And uh, Cole was promoting uh, Vygotsky research uh, among cognitive scientists, and uh, not only through his efforts, but in fact, uh, not without them. Uh, at the edge of centuries, we see the cultural revolution and cognitive science, which could be explained uh, through three simple steps announced by Cole in his seminal paper in 2003. Uh, the first point is that human mind changes across development through socialization as acquisition of cultural practices, science, and their systems, but the culture changes as well. New practices emerge, new ar artifacts emerge, new systems of science emerge. We for example can see the emergence of the system of emoticons or new devices, or digital ecologies we live in now. And what cognitive science should study is how human mind changes in a culture that does not remain unchangeable. So the most interesting topic of study is a changing mind in a changing culture. And uh, if we take a closer look at uh, this changing mind and the changing culture through the evolutionary perspective, uh, we will find the idea of co-evolution of genes, brain, and culture proposed uh, by, for example, Peter Richardson and Robert Boyd, the authors of uh, one of the versions of dual inheritance theories, uh, which means that people with certain genes and a certain brain create a certain culture. And culture 
uh, gives a priority to people with certain gene, genes and certain brains, and they create and develop this culture, and the culture gives priority to people with a certain genotype and so forth. So they just get intertwined and we cannot distinguish cultural evolution from biological evolution in the a human community anymore. And the same can be observed in the individual acquisition of culture. What Vygotsky describes as the development of higher mental functions is a process which is both culturally determined and biologically supported because it supposes the formation of functional systems in the brain. Uh, that is why Lambrus Malafouris, the uh, British-based uh, archaeologist, uh, one of the leaders of the research area called neuroarchaeology, uh, defines brain as a buyer artifact, as an object, biological object shaped by cultural evolution. Uh, for him, uh, humans are basically uh, cyber species, evolved together with cultural artifacts. Uh, which means that our brain develops together with the material culture under its influence. And first tools people use to control nature, first material tools uh, for Malafouris are in fact material science defining how to act on them. For example, the Aldovan tool prompts uh, a human how to shape it and how people act on such tools or with such tools are not products of human thinking, uh, but rather are acts of thinking supported uh, by affordances which are implemented in the very first human tools. And uh, what neuroarchaeology attempts to do is to explain the evolution of human mind and human brain through the evolution of material tools. And in fact, the influence of tools uh, on functional systems in the brain uh, could be seen as early as uh, in primates. Uh, there was really a unique study, uh, there are quite long comments in the chat, I'll read them just after the lecture, thanks Dmitry. Uh, when uh, apes, when monkeys, use tools, this tool use reconstructs the, the working of their brain, the functions of their brain. So uh, I just mentioned a study by uh, Maravita and Derike, 2004, uh, who investigated the response of single cells, single neurons in the cortex of monkeys as a response uh, to some external stimulation. Every neural cell uh, in our sensory cortex has got its so-called receptive field. For example, they find uh, a neuron uh, responding to visual stimulation in the area of the monkey's paw. For example, if you put light here, the neuron in the cortex uh, demonstrates activity. Uh, when we stimulate some other area in the space, uh, both around uh, the pore or within the monkey's body, there is no response from this neuron. Uh, then the researchers let the monkey use a tool 
to move a fruit toward its, itself. And after the monkey has this experience of using the tool to move fruit, this one single neuron starts responding to the area of both pool and the tool. Can you imagine? And if the, man, the monkey just holds the tool passively, there is no response to this tool in this neural cell. There is a response just to the area of the pool. Uh, so now you can imagine uh, how our hobbies, occupations, and other cultural practices uh, shape our brain. Uh, no, there are really lots of data demonstrating uh, how it happens. Probably uh, among the first uh, studies, uh, there was a research uh, by Japanese uh, scholars who discovered that mental calculation in the brain is being lateralized to the right or to the left hemisphere, depending on how people learn to count. Uh, in Europeans, uh, the calculation is shifted or literalized to the left, like verbal functions. We count by the same brain areas with peak, we produce speech. But uh, that's because uh, probably we are being educated this way. In Japan, uh, young school children uh, are learning to count uh, using this sort of abacus called soroban. And uh, what happens? Uh, in adults, the mental calculation is literalized to the right, to the brain areas involved, for example, in image processing, image rotation. So, it's just the same function of calculation, but in Europeans, it's found mostly in the left hemisphere, but in Japanese people who uh, interiorize, internalize uh, this abacus and calculate through image transformation, it is being literalized to the other hemisphere. Uh, another example, uh, which is really quite funny and more about professional experience uh, as the professional deformation of visual attention in a Canadian postman. Uh, it's about the influence of a male sorting experience on our visual attention studied by Paul Confar at the very end of uh, 1990s. Uh, our visual attention is organized in such a way that when the object can be distinguished from the rest of objects in the uh, visual field by just one feature, like green tea here. It just pops out. You don't need time to find it. It doesn't matter how many objects there are on the screen. You find this green tea here and down here exactly at the same time. It just pop out, pops out and that's it. But when the object uh, can be distinguished by two or more features like this a green horizontal T here or there. It does take some time to shift, to move your attention from one location to another to locate this. Uh, the same happens for so-called overlearned stimuli like letters and numbers. Uh, we always see letters together and words and texts, and we usually see numbers together. And for example, it's really easy to find letter B here. If we were in the normal room, uh, I would just ask you to clap, but I cannot. And it's a bit hard to find letter B here. It does take some time. Also, it's really easy to find the number eight here at the right upper corner and it is a little bit difficult it takes time to find the number eight among other numbers but can you imagine that all four images 
are just the same for Canadian postmen. Why so? Because uh, Canadian zip codes, as well as British zip codes, include both numbers and letters. Uh, Dmitry has a good comment that letters and numbers are a little bit different, different in their haste, but well, believe me, it's just the same when they are absolutely equalized. That was just a demonstration and I did not calibrate it really well, sorry. But uh, anyway, what we see here is how professional experience transforms our visual attention. And probably the most well-known study was the research by the Ig Nobel Prize winner, uh, Eleanor McGuire, uh, who ran a series of experiments with London cab drivers. A little bit before the common use of navigation systems. Uh, by that time, uh, London cab drivers was, you know, a professional guild which required a long educational period and a serious exam which required uh, constructing a path from any point on the London map to any other point, of course, mentally. And uh, what uh, Eleanor Maguire discovered with her team studying not even the functioning, which is important, but the structure, the volume of different parts of the cab driver's brain. She discovered that the posterior parts of uh, hippocampus in cab drivers was physically larger than in ordinary people. Uh, how, could he, how, how could she uh, demonstrate that this uh, change could be related to this specific professional experience? Well, she did it quite easily. Actually, she compared cab drivers, not just to ordinary people, but to bus drivers with the same driving experience, but the lack of this navigation tasks. tasks sorry. And what they, this, this team discovered was that the brain of cab drivers had a larger posterior hippocampus, whereas bus drivers were similar to ordinary people. Uh, finally, they decided to understand whether this brain change was related to the driving experience or learning experience rather than to some, you know, abilities of cab drivers. And she compared two groups of cab drivers, uh, one of them who passed exam and the other of those who failed the exam and she discovered that initially both groups were the same but at the end of the four years training those who passed the exam had this increase in the hippocampus size but those who failed the exam didn't have this increase and in fact it's a very important uh, point uh, despite of the Ig Nobel Prize, because probably, according to Lambros Malafuri's uh, hypothesis, this is exactly what happens through the evolutionary line. Uh, Malafuri introduces a very important concept of metaplasticity. And he believes that through the course of cultural evolution, we acquire exactly this feature, the ever-increasing flexibility of functional and structural 
brain architecture. So through the evolution, we acquire the ability to reconstruct our brain in such a way uh, that we would adapt better to any new occupation, profession, activity, or whatever. And in fact, uh, Maguire's study were, you know, a starting point for huge explosion in the research of structural changes of the brain through a variety of cultural practices. Uh, there were uh, first uh, studies on uh, meditation, typewriting, ballet dancing, or even visual search, I demonstrated to you a little bit earlier. But then uh, in the middle of 2010s, uh, the data were obtained on a lot of hobbies and occupations. Um, you see them here on the screen. Uh, I will not list all of them, but among them there are musicians, uh, performers, divers, uh, sportsmen, and lots of other people. And there are a couple of important things about these studies. Uh, if I try to generalize, the important things are that functional system optimization can include not only increase of certain brain areas, not only you know, an ability to grow it up, yeah, but also a decrease in the volume of specialized, specialized brain structures. For example, if we look at musicians, uh, we will see a decrease in somatosensory areas connected, for example, to finger movements, together with the increase of cognitive areas uh, connected to scores reading. Uh, or in chess players, we mostly see the decrease of all areas involved. Maybe, you know, as a mirror of decrease or minimization of mental operations uh, when analyzing uh, positions on the board. Also, the changes uh, observed for both specialized brain areas and tracts connecting these areas to each other. And uh, there are two things which are even more important. The first uh, one is that professional success might be predicted using these uh, morphometry data, the larger or the smaller the area, the more or less uh, successful the person is. But the longitudinal studies and comparison of groups with different experience uh, show that these differences in brain structure and brain volume are experience-based rather than uh, demonstrate an initial, initial aptitude for a certain occupation or activity. Uh, so, uh, what is this uh, story about? It's mostly about the unique brain plasticity, not only functional, but also structural, perhaps acquired through evolution uh, uh, and through mastering of a variety of developing, developing changing cultural practices across the evolutionary line. And of course, when we choose an occupation or prefer a certain hobby available in our culture, we choose how our brain will develop and how it will look like. Well, that's mostly it. And I saw lots of questions in the chat and I'll address them right now. 
Uh -huh. So this is this is where we can go to gallery view and everyone can unmute their microphone and we give the initial like real life after the talk we give the applause. Let's try it. Thank you. Thank you. And now um, we can go to the questions and discussion period. And um, I don't know, Maria, how you want to handle this. You can select from the chat and ask the people to speak if they want, or you can read it out, <clears throat> or people can raise their hands. Uh, but I think you can manage it yourself. You don't need oh. me. For this uh, okay. Um. And we have I'll, at least 15, with 10 or 15 more minutes, if you'd like, for that. Uh, yeah, um, I started a little bit later, so I a told you so. longer, <laughs> but uh, no, no, I, no. I, I, I hope we'll have enough. Wow, more questions are coming. Okay, I'll start from the beginning uh, from uh, Jovna's question about whether cognition is measurable. Well, we can measure certain cognitive functions using, for example, the reaction time, like in visual search tasks, or we can uh, measure performance, how successfully uh, a person performs a certain task, like we did with uh, this fast letter recognition test. So the right number of measures psychologists use. And of course we can measure brain activity. I think we can uh, use, you know, some uh, measures like oxygenations used in magnetic resonance imaging, functional imaging, I mean, or we can me measure the electric signals like in electroencephalography. And uh, as I showed in the last part of my talk, uh, we can measure brain volume to understand how it changes through involvement in certain practices. Aha. Uh -huh. And some comments and questions from Dmitry. While it is undoubtable that we have instruments of self-regulation which are modified by our experience, uh, does this necessarily exclude universal genetic high-level psychological tools of self-regulation? Uh, yeah, it looks like it does exclude it because we do not see them in animals and we do not see them in humans raised by animals. There are a number Unfortunately, a number of such experiments are performed by nature itself, and we never see um, such regulation, self-regulations, even invention of psychological tools by children raised or fed by wild animals. Then a number of answers to... You also have one raised hand in the actual audience. Okay, uh, I, I think I'll uh, run through the chat. Okay, all right. And then we ask Jana. Okay, just want to make sure you see. That's question, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Dmitry asks about tools and tools and uh, he writes that it's unlikely that the earlier tools, such as uh, uh, Ashalen, were science in any significant uh, sense. Non-cultural but tool-related experience can also modify neurons, hence the memory. Uh, well, in fact, uh, older one tools were older than Ashalen tools, and there is a difference between the two, uh, which could be discovered uh, through the recordings of brain activity in modern people trying to make Oldovan and Eshelian tools. Because uh, as I uh, told you, Oldovan tools uh, show how to act on them. They contain affordances. They hint what the next cut should be. And uh, they uh, activate, you know, uh, parietal cortex, which is involved in spatial regulations. Uh, whereas uh, Achelian tools activate frontal cortex, which means that there is a certain plan or strategy behind 
their creation and use. And there was probably a jump from one kind of tools to the other kind of tools through this uh, line of embodied cognition development. First, it was a tool which guided its use. And then it was human which controlled the use of the tool. Um, hmm. Then Dimitri again <clears throat> says that uh, too much flexibility can be harmful to effective functioning. Specialized face recognition parts of brain do work better in their domain than attempts to compensate for them with general intelligence by uh, prosopognostic people. Well, basically, yeah, uh, there are some functions, uh, probably the most evolutionary significant functions and stimuli types which are hardwired in our brains. Yeah, for example, uh, shape perception or face perception or even place perception hardwired in the parhippocampal place area, necessary for really fast response, automatic response from the human. Yeah, we use faces to you know, recognize each other, to uh, read, um, our counterparts emotion and for a number of other things. And it's important to be able to do it really fast. Uh, scaffolding or cultural tool use does require some time for internalization and for automatization. And uh, that's why probably some most important functions. We're hardwired through evolution, but unfortunately it makes it difficult to uh, rehabilitate people uh, with strokes in the areas responsible for these functions. And some higher functions uh, are reconstructed through uh, our experience, but that's why we can use them how we want them to use. That's the main Vygotsky's idea. idea. Uh, then uh, Stiopa's question, does it mean that the brain physically gets larger in some parts or only that existing fragments of the brain are reassigned to different subsystems? That's still a question. Uh, what we can measure by morphometry is exactly the volume of so-called voxels one by one by one millimeter uh, pieces of the brain. But what really happens? Uh, does it uh, mean that uh, glia cells grow or the amount increase or there are more connections? It is still not known for sure. Because oh, to do such research, uh, unfortunately, we need so-called post-mortem methods. And fortunately, most of the participants of such studies are still alive. Uh, because these are recent studies. Uh, a good question from John from Thailand. Is plasticity strongly age-related? Uh, not really. Uh, the study with meditation uh, involved participants who were uh, 80 years old and um, the, there were significant changes in their frontal cortex after the two weeks retreat experience. Then the question from Anna, what is your opinion on what are emotions? Are emotions of an objective kind or are concepts of emotions also tools for actions in social words? Do having words for emotions changes our neuronal ways involved in emotion generation? Also, can we say that words are tools themselves? Uh, I'll start with the last part of this question, which is probably the easiest one. Yes, of course, words are the tools. And uh, for example, uh, in Vygotsky's 
probably most important and the very last book, Thinking and Speech. He demonstrates step by step how these tools are acquired and used for the course of individual development. Uh, as for motions, there is uh, still no uh, common opinion about it. For example, uh, now one of the most popular predictive co coding accounts uh, of emotions proposed by Lisa Barrett uh, treats them as categories and uh, emotional reaction as an act of categorization, which contains uh, a certain prediction of how the world will change. But from the evolutionary point of view, uh, emotions probably emerge, uh, you know, as an evolutionary biological instrument uh, to choose one of possible, one of many possible actions in a, a world full of opportunities and one of uh, a number of needs which are actualized in the organism at the same time. So it's, you know, might be a way to uh, solve this hard choice problem. And um, I don't know a universal accepted theory, but basically there are two of them. Um, one half of emotional theorists tra treats them, you know, as subjective uh, representation of needs and motives. The other group treats them, you know, as estimation of the situation. And Lisa Barrett's approach is an example of the second group. And the second uh, constructivist group, of course, considers them as a kind of instruments. And in this way, uh, concepts of emotions are uh, definitely tools of social interaction. I would answer this way. Okay, Alex, are you aware of language revolution group from the University of Edinburgh and their research? If yes, do you think their model of language iterative learning is viable or its per definition flawed because their participants are L2 learners. Uh, well, uh, I know just the name of the group and I'll take a closer look to the group itself. It's definitely worth doing as follows from your question. Okay, then there are a number of thanks and question from Yomna. What if we need to measure cognition on the textual level? I would probably need a clarification of what the textual level is. Mm -hmm. Like in a novel. I don't think so. An article. Mm, I don't I don't think so. And how can we measure it from the speaker to the listener or the reader as long as we want to measure the speaker or writer talk? There is no way in fact, because uh, our cognition is constructive. It's another topic I really love to speak about. And the story in the speaker's head and the story in the listener's head and the story as it is are three separate stories. And uh, there, is an, there is no objective measure uh, rather than a percent of coincidence in the, in the three to measure information transmission in humans. Then there is an exchange between Alex and Dimitri and a question from Monica from Geneva. Is it any map developed on how the brain shapes according particular activities? Can any recommendations be already made about which brain shapes are more healthy or positive? And uh, which activities are therefore advised to perform to reach such shapes? Well, in fact, there are mm, 
no recommendations yet because so this is the research of the last five or six or seven years or so and in fact any activity your brain is involved in is good for the brain because you construct new functional systems you uh, make your neural cells work and connect to each other and analyze information and the more your brain is involved in information processing, the better it is for the brain. Uh, okay, now I think I'll take a question from Jana finally. Jana, sorry, <laughs> you had to wait really for a long time. Thank you very much, Maria Vyacheslavna. Well, my, I'm, I'm not a psychologist and um, I, I should admit it first because probably my question is pretty naive, but I've always wanted to, um, clear it for myself and from this lecture it came it came related to this lecture so I would like to ask you whether um, like as you spoke about hippotamus and um, taxi drivers uh, I wonder no I, the thing is that uh, before I read that um, the size of brain correspond this the size of brain corresponding to the size of body doesn't doesn't represent the um, let's say so-called intelligence, like mind capabilities. No. But from what it comes, it seems as if it does. And what's the um, modern view of the, the current view? Thank you. Uh, well, basically, what I was talking about are really uh, tiny but statistically significant changes in specific brain areas. And um, for example, with uh, hippocampus and cab drivers, it's even uh, a more tricky thing because they had the, this increase in posterior areas of their hippocampus and the decrease in the interior areas as compared to ordinary people. So maybe it was just, you know, a reconstruction of functional system, not just uh, increase. And because uh, maybe it's not due to neural cells themselves, but due to uh, so-called glia cells, which you know interconnect neural cells and the brain just like fill in the brain um they do not i mean glia cells do not uh, perform the function of information transmission or processing they perform some other functions not yet uh, studied well enough but uh, they have nothing to do with intelligence and uh, these tiny changes uh, in the brain structure uh, are not about uh, intelligence or some other abilities they are just about functional systems uh, constructed to provide for certain cultural practices or occupational habits or whatever, uh, but not about you no know, huge changes in the size of the brain as a whole. Okay, one more question from John. Uh, most linguistic research is based on people from literate cultures. Uh, either introspection or studies from literate participants. I've long wondered how far the conclusions can be extended to non-literate groups. Would you expect the two to be very different at the level of the brain? Uh, well, there will be differences uh, in uh, their brain function, uh, maybe some differences in their uh, brain structure. Structure. There was uh, a very, uh, you know, funny abbreviation uh, about uh, so-called uh, weird studies. Uh, Western educated. Uh, oh my God! I do not rem remember the all. Uh, ah industrialized, rich, and democratic cultures. 
uh, as opposed to all other cultures. And there was you know, even a slogan to stop studying those weird people and to start studying other people. But literacy does change the brain. Uh, there was a study I really uh, love from uh, Castro Caldas and colleagues from 1998, uh, performed in, uh, 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 in uh, rural uh, Portugal. Uh, where there was a tradition to, when there are a couple of daughters in the same family, to leave the first daughter at home to help her mom uh, with other children and with cooking and with cleaning and whatever, and the second daughter could go to school and uh, learn to read and to write and to count. And uh, what they did, they took two groups of Portuguese girls from exactly the same families and with exactly the same uh, genotype because they were from the same families. Uh, but uh, the first group was illiterate because they were first daughters and the second group was literate because they were second daughters. And they compared uh, how their brain worked when they performed uh, really simple tasks. Uh, the girls were asked to repeat so-called pseudo words. Uh, all linguists know what it is. Yes, a pseudo word, like a common filler. Uh, like we take a word brain and we use for, make it say frame. I hope there is no such word <laughs> in English. And um, what they discovered that the brain of two groups of girls, literate and illiterate girls from the same families worked differently. And, uh, 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 and different brain areas were involved in the performance uh, as if literate girls or performed phonetical analysis, uh, which um, is related to the temporal cortex. And illiterate girls try just to make similar sounds, treating the pseudo word as a whole. So you can imagine just a simple uh, four year school experience changed a uh, whole brain worked. So there will be differences between weird countries and people and other people which are not literate yet maybe. <laughs> uh -huh. There is a question from Mulzat uh, from Berlin. Uh, John, uh, can we take it or just please guide the process? You're guiding the process so beautifully, Maria, that I feel like I don't need to do anything. Um, I think we should take about one or two more questions. How about that? And then I can also tell you one thing, which is that we will have a record of the chat. And so we can uh, get you a file with the record of the chat and we can create uh, you know, a way to post if you want to write more answers that the students could read afterwards or maybe some references or anything like that, uh, we can organize that. But right now, maybe one or two more. Is that good? Okay. Right. Uh, just a minute, I, I'm typing a reference. Uh, for Andrea. Okay, there was a question from, uh, no, that, that's a comment. Yeah, that question actually, uh, maybe it will be similar to the, that you already answered. Um, so, I was wondering about this Luria's expedition uh, to Central Asia in 1930s. So how is his work is relevant or discussed by the contemporary scholars of your area? Because I recently also read, uh, it was done, kind of redone Luria's expedition. Uh, I read an article by Glosman, I think her name is Glosman from Russia. And so they kind of re-repeated same kind of experience um, with the Siberian 
uh, I don't remember the Nanai or I don't remember. Uh, and then they kind of find out the um, uh, same results which were done by Luria in 1930s. So I had lots of questions while reading the article, but I'm very curious how would you respond to it? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. It's really a very long question. Uh, I probably need first to say a couple of words about the expedition itself. Yeah, it was uh, organized by Vygotsky and Luria in Central uh, Asia in uh, some emerging Soviet republics uh, with uh, illiterate, not educated rural people uh, whom they tested uh, in a number of uh, tests like, you know, generalization and image perception and memory and compare it to educated uh, city dwellers. And well, uh, what they discovered were, you know, a lack of uh, generalization, like functional generalization, for example, when you see uh, a cow and a hen and hay. Uh, Uzbek people would uh, join a cow and a hay and remove a hen, and uh, city people would join uh, conceptually a hen and a cow and remove hay. And uh, they also discovered that um, Uzbeks didn't have uh, so-called gestalt psychology illusions, like they wouldn't uh, call a circle with a break just a circle. They would uh, call it, you know, a bracelet or a fence or whatever, but not a circle, as well as uh, a square with a break. They would not call a square, but would use something from their experience. There was even an anecdotal uh, story of how Luria uh, sent uh, a telegram to Moscow, to Vygotsky. Uzbeks don't have illusions. And that was Stalin's time and received an answer. And uh, Luria doesn't have any brains. Uh, and uh, now there is, you know, an ongoing discussion uh, how relevant and how accurate and how replicable were the experiments. You probably could find the paper by uh, Anton Yasnitsky who tried to analyze that expedition in detail and show that uh, Luria demonstrated what he wanted to demonstrate, not what was really observed. And uh, Kurt Kovka, a Gestalt psychologist who also participated in that expedition, did found Gestalt illusions in the same Uzbeks. But uh, for example, in uh, Mike Cole's studies from uh, 19, uh, 1970s, published uh, in his book uh, with uh, Sylvia uh, Scribner, Culture and Thought, I guess, 1976. Um, Cole described the same illiteracy effects in uh, African, I guess, people. And uh, I guess they did some research with Indians, but here I'm not uh, sure because it was quite long ago when I read it myself, but I do remember Africa research. But uh, the difference is mostly how people use their cognition, how they generalize, how they perceive. Do they use some culturally introduced tools? Uh, first of all, through school education, or do they use their own specific experience? And if they use their own specific experience, they of course uh, demonstrate this functional classification, functional generalization, and functional naming for objects without any attempt to generalize or categorize them to groups, whereas with uh, formal education, they use more formal uh, <clears throat> naming and uh, more formal categorization rules. So that's the idea, uh, but the discussion is still ongoing. 
and there is no final answer who was right and who was wrong. And I, I guess um, we'll hear more about it uh, within the next few years. No more questions? Maybe, maybe, we, should, maybe we should leave it at that. Um, what we will do is we will gather all the, the entire record of the chat uh, and we will get it to you, Maria. And if you would be willing to uh, get us a copy of your slideshow, we can post it on the website along with the chat. And if you want to write any responses or post anything else, there'll be a place to post articles or links to anything and the discussion can continue. Um, and if you don't mind sharing a way to get in touch with you for students who want to, um, you could give them your email address, but that's up to you. Uh, my email address is already in the chat. So okay. Okay. Can Great. Oh, I see. Yes, I see. It's hard to copy out of the chat, but I think it's also on your handout and it's on your website. Yeah, so, the, it's available um, on my personal page, so that's okay. no problem. Very good. So let's everybody uh, unmute your microphones. Uh, great discussion. Uh, I wish if we see Maria, this just shows that we needed a full course from you and not just a single lecture because there's so much discussion. Maybe some other time in the future. This is how we draw people into the school. Um, but let us thank our speaker for starting us off with such a great discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you guys for a multitude of questions. That was really inspiring. <laughs> Hi, everybody. See you tomorrow. Have a great night, day, morning, evening, afternoon. Bye.